Hello and welcome to Lecture 15. I'm Chris Mack and this is the course from Data to Decisions. In this lecture I'm going to show you how to do moment testing, in particular skewness and kurtosis testing, using Excel. So I've imported a data set from data set number one and it's the one that I've, uh, I've talked about before. It is a set of data from Ambler and Jones of the National Bureau of Standards where they made 100 measurements of a standardized weight a week for 100 weeks and then collected all that data and uh, published it. So I have put that data here in the spreadsheet. What's actually being plotted here is the difference from 10 grams in milligrams. So when it says 375, they weighted at 10.375 grams. So we're going to uh, take a look at this data. We've already used it to make a QQ plot, a normal probability plot in a previous lecture. And we noticed that it had what looked like uh, heavy tails. Other than that, it sort of looked like a normal distribution. So what would that data look like if we were to do a skewness and a kurtosis test? Let's do that. Uh, I have copied and pasted from um, the lectures all the relevant formulas. G1 is our estimator for gamma 1, the skewness metric. Little uh, G1 is a bias metric, capital G1 unbiased metric. The standard error for G1 is given by this formula. G2 is our excess kurtosis measure, and here's our estimator here. It's a biased estimator. Capital G2 uh, makes a correction to that estimator to make it unbiased for small sample sizes. And then uh, we go down a little bit further, we got the standard error of G2 as well. So I just cut and paste all those formulas so that they're handy as a reference. So how are we going to calculate G1? We need uh, the central moments of the data set. So to center the data set, I simply take the data and subtract off the mean. So this formula says B9, the actual data point here, minus uh, B5, and B5 is the average of all the data. In other words, the mean. So this column simply goes through and subtracts off the mean of every data point. Then uh, the subsequent, subsequent columns, I've, I've taken that column and squared it, cubed it, and raised it to the fourth power. So there's that value squared. There's the same value C9 to the cube power and to the fourth power. And then all the data uh, shows that. Then finally at the top, I calculate the central moment, which is simply the average of all of those values. Now the central moment uh, of the second central moment, well, that's our estimate of the variance. In fact, if I were to do equals var dot p of all of the data, B9 to down here to B108, I should get the exact same number as the average of this column. And sure enough, that's that's what I get. Uh, I do the variance dot P, the population variance. So I'm dividing by N rather than N by minus one. But that's what the formulas here require. Divide by N rather than N minus one, our estimates. Uh, as we said, G1 is biased, but we're going to unbias it later. All right, I've got all of these central moments calculated. If I want my statistic G1, it's simply the third central moment. That's the E7 column in row, E7 cell right here, divided by the second central moment to the, to the 1.5 power. Well, the second central moment Square root, that's the standard deviation. So standard deviation to the third power. That's now our metric, G1. It's a biased metric, so we unbias it by multiplying it by the square root of n times n minus 1, divide that by n minus 2. So this formula here accomplishes that task. And the result is uh, a slight variation. Because n is large, the difference between the biased and the unbiased metrics is extremely small. In fact, it's probably pretty negligible. We really only worry about the difference between uh, the unbiased and the biased metric here when n is yeah, 
20 or 30 or less. Uh, it has to be reasonably small value of n before it makes much of a difference. Nonetheless, we might as well use the more exact, unbiased formula. So that's G1. The skewness is 0.55. It's a positive number. As we saw before in the lectures, positive skewness means the tail goes to the right. I plotted up on a hist in a histogram the data. Does that look like the tail is skewed to the right? Uh, I don't know. Maybe. You can't really tell. It's, it's, it's a small amount of skew. If there is skew there, it's a small amount of skew. So that brings up the question. I've got a number like 0.55. What does that mean? Do you have any intuition as to the meaning of, of the magnitude of this number? I know positive means skewed right. I know zero means it's not skewed. I know negative means it's skewed to the left. But is 0.5 a big number? Is that a lot of skew? Skew kind of you know, difficult to, to get some intuition about it. One way to judge the magnitude of that number, to say whether it's a big number or small number, is to compare it to the standard error of that estimate. So we've got a formula for the standard error of G1. If I calculate what that is, I get 0.24. In other words, the standard error, one standard deviation of this estimate, is about 0.24. So 0.55 plus or minus one standard deviation is 0.55 plus or minus 0.24. Uh, 0.55 plus or minus two standard deviations is uh, uh, 0.55 plus or minus 0.48. That kind of gives us an idea of whether or not we think G1 is big or small compare it to the standard error. In fact, if we take the ratio of our estimate of the parameter, G1, to the standard error of that parameter, SE of G1, we get what we call the studentized value, the studentized version of that parameter. Here I call it Z of G1, and we see it's about 2.3. Now we have a number that we can get some intuition for because our assumption, or not our assumption, uh, uh, what we know out sampling distribution of this metric G1, of the skewness, is that if n is about bigger than 20, if we have a reasonable number of data points, z will be normally distributed. That is, G1 divided by the standard error will be a standard normal distribution. If our assumption is correct, that it comes from a normal distribution, the data comes from a normal distribution, then z will be a standard normal um, variable. Uh, so because of that, we can take the z value and ask, what is the p-value? What is the probability of getting a value of z of this magnitude or larger? That's the meaning of the term p-value. What's the probability of getting a, a, a value of this magnitude or bigger, more unusual than this, assuming random chance alone. And so we can calculate the p-value. Here's the calculation. Uh, I would like everyone who wants to be able to do these calculations on their own to carefully look at this formula, download the spreadsheet, lecture15.xlsx, uh, from the website, look at the formula, make sure you understand it. Why did I use this formula? Well, it's got the normal distribution. Normal distribution, norm.s.dist, is a normal standard distribution. And the first parameter is z, the z value. Right? So I plugged in my z value, which is 2.29 right here. Then it says comma cumulative. This is where I can decide whether I want the PDF or the CDF. If I put true, then it gives me the cumulative probability or the cumulative distribution function. This is the area under the PDF curve from minus infinity all the way to this z value. That's what then norm.s.dist gives me. The area under the normal probability curve from minus infinity to z. But what I really want is, is the opposite. I want the, the 
area under the curve from z to positive infinity. How do I get that? Subtract it from 1. And then every probability, if I integrate from minus infinity to infinity, has a value of 1 for the area. So if I take 1 minus norm.s.dist, uh, minus the area under the curve up to z, then I get the area of the tail, the upper tail. So 1 minus norm s dot dist gives me the upper tail. I'm going to do a two-tailed test, which means I want the area in both the upper and the lower tails. If z were plus 2.9 or minus 2.9 or less, excuse me, 2.29. If z were 2.29 and larger or 2.29 less, I want the area in both tails. So I simply multiply by 2 right here. All right, that's my p-value. Think about it. Make sure that you can calculate a p-value whenever you need to using techniques like this, thinking about whether it's single-tailed or double-tailed. What's that p-value? 022. That is, there is a 2.2% probability that I would get a z-value for the skewness of this large of magnitude or larger just based on random chance. Assuming the null hypothesis is true. Assuming the distribution that I pulled this 100 data points from is truly a normal distribution. About 2.2% of all of the samples I could have made of 100 data points will give me a z value of this magnitude or larger, either 2.3 or larger on the plus side or minus 2.3 and smaller on the negative side. That's what two, this p-value means. So I compare that p-value to my significance level, and then I either reject or fail to reject. If my significance level were 0.05, I see that this p-value is less than 0.05. That means this is a more rare case my significance level allows, and I can reject null hypothesis that the distribution is random, uh, excuse me, normal, not skewed. If, however, I picked alpha of 0.01, uh, then I couldn't reject it. I would say for that significance level, the data does not give me enough information to reject. Of course, that doesn't prove that the distribution is normal. It simply says there's not enough data here to show me that it's not normal. Well, you can see this p-value is kind of on the borderline of what normal significance levels we often pick. So it's kind of in be an in-between case. So I'm going to go ahead and do the kurtosis test anyways. Uh, you know, we only do the kurtosis test for whether the tails are too heavy or too light compared to a normal. If we, uh, excuse me, if we pass the skewness test. Well, since we almost passed the skewness test, we're on the borderline here. I'm going to go ahead and do the kurtosis test anyways. So what's the kurtosis metric? I simply take uh, F7, which is the fourth central moment, divide by the second central moment squared, and that's G2. Highest estimate of kurtosis. Uh, there's the unbiased estimate where I correct it by the factors shown from the equation here. I calculate the standard error of that estimate, again, using the equations that I've provided. And the ratio of those two is the z value v2. Now, notice something about this z value. It is not about 2, it's about 20, a much, much larger z value. And when I calculate the p value for that particular z value, I get not exactly zero. It's just an incredibly small p-value. The probability that I would draw 100 numbers from a normal distribution, and it be these 100 numbers, or even more unusual than these 100 numbers, is essentially zero. So even if we were willing to accept that it really is a normal distribution from the skewness test, we would look at the kurtosis test, the excess kurtosis test, and see that there's no way that uh, we could say that this is a normal distribution. Those tails are way heavy. 
All right, that's how we do moment testing. Uh, quick note, Excel has a skew function. If I were to simply use the skew function and provided all the data directly from, from the data, B9 through B108, it will provide back for me G, G1, the unbiased estimate of the skew. Likewise, there's a CURT function, K-U-R-T in Excel. It is the kurtosis uh, uh, estimator, and it is the capital G2, the unbiased estimator of the kurtosis. So I could bypass some of the calculations that I have to do here by simply using the built-in Excel functions. But there is no built-in Excel function to tell us the standard errors. And therefore, to do the moment testing, I'll have to calculate those standard errors by hand, calculate the z-value, the ratio of the statistic to its standard error, and the p-values all manually. But uh, that's not hard to do if we have these formulas. And as a result, we do our tests, we make our conclusion. That's it for Lecture 15.